680 pages, and we now have it boiled down to about 56. If any of you want this entire synopsis, um, I'll send it to Carol and she can go ahead and get it out to you. What I went ahead and did was went through, the bill went through this synopsis to kind of try to uh, flesh out what's probably going to be most important to restaurants in New Mexico and those small business in New Mexico. So the first change, you're going to hear about the Payment Protection Program. This uh, allows under 7A of the Small Business Act 100% guaranteed loans. So I'm going to go through the high points for restaurants. One, it includes sole proprietors, independent contracts, contractors, and other self-employed individuals. This is important because if you um, you know, you are a brand new restaurant, you haven't done your uh, corporate formation documents or taken your, your subchapter S elections with the IRS, or maybe you're so new you haven't even filed your first tax return, this is important because it opens this program to all of these um, eligible classes. This is really the program that you're gonna look to because it's eligible for um, 500 and under um, em employers who have 500 or fewer um, employees. So I'm going to talk a little bit because this program, there's there's the program we talked about about a week ago, which is the SBA Disaster Relief Funding Loan. I'm going to talk a little bit about the two, um, and don't get them confused, but I'm going to try to keep it organized so you can understand how the two work together. So this uh, sets the maximum payment protection loan at $10 million. I don't know of restaurants in New Mexico that are going to need $10 million for payroll over the next three months, but it's a good um, amount of money to make sure that people have the resources they need. What's important is this allows the borrower who has an EIDL loan, this is the disaster loans that we talked about, related to COVID-19 that was made after January 31, 2020. So if you, um, those loans we talked about through the SBA, which are the disaster relief loans, if you apply for one of those, you have the option to refinance that loan into a PPP loan until the end of the covered period. So between now and June 30th, 2020. So if you started the process to get your full SBA disaster relief loan um, within the last two weeks when those became available to New Mexicans, you can, you can consolidate that loan into one of these loans. However, there's a grant that's being given as part of the disaster relief loan so we're going to we're talking about two separate loans. We're going to separate them into disaster relief loan, which is the loans that we've been talking about for the past two two weeks under the SBA program. Okay. And then you have the new loans that are going to be signed into law by the president. Hopefully soon, we're going to call those PPP loans. So under that disaster loan, there's a grant available for ten thousand dollars. Okay. Um, so, so that's the only uh, thing that, that's going to have some nuance related to consolidating that loan into this loan. Important things about the PPP loan is it waives collateral and personal guarantee requirements under the program. Generally, SBA loans don't waive collateral, have some collateral. Um, you don't necessarily have to be credit worthy, but they are. They, they do have different regulations. This is an important piece because if you sign up for one of these loans and at the end of the day, your restaurant doesn't make it, you're not personally guaranteed, meaning they can't come after your house, they can't come after your car, your 401k, they can only come after the assets of the business. Uh, another important factor is that it sets the maximum interest rate at 4%. What we're seeing in the state program, the disaster loans as well as PPP loans are very low interest rates. So it's important to look at this. And if you have other higher credit, um, other higher interest credit that you have right now, you know, it's not a bad idea just as a good business measure to get into one of these loans, especially because, again, we're waiving that personal guarantee requirement. So the other thing is it's going to the SBA is requiring any PPP lenders to defer payments for at, le at least six months, not more than a year. But you'll see later on where they say you should you will not pay interest or principal on the loan for the first six months from the date of the first due date. So if you get a loan today, the first due date's not today. So you're looking at really seven months of, of deferral. Um, 
because it's, it starts the day that, that that loan first comes due. This is, this is one of the most important parts of the PPP loans. We had a, there was a business conference call with President Trump um, probably about a week ago. And he said this loan forgiveness is something that he would sign. This is important to us. And it establishes that the borrower shall be eligible for loan forgiveness equal to the amount of, of um, by the borrower during an eight week period after the origination date of the loan on payroll costs, interest payments on mortgage, mortgages that you got prior to February 15, 2020, payment for rent on any lease in force prior to February 15, 2020. Now, if you are truly a brand new restaurant, you opened in the last 30 days, send me an email and we'll talk about how there might be some other things you can do and, and things we can do to, to work towards this. But basically what it's saying is for the, the next eight weeks, so you want to, if you're going to apply for these loans, I suggest you do it sooner rather than later. Reason is, first off, you get that seven months interest, interest and um, principal that you don't have to pay. You're going to get the lower interest rate. But keep in mind that these eight-week periods are really starting um, from the origination date. And most of these have a kind of a sunshine clause, if you will, of June 30th, 2020. So this isn't something you can say, let's wait and see how May goes. Let's let's apply. Let's see if we can get through June, get through the next quarter. Don't do it. Just go ahead and apply for them. But this says, um, you know, the amount forgiven is not going to exceed $100,000 in wages. But for most restaurants over an eight week period, if you go ahead and pay your employees anyway, you know, this is this is an important component. Covered rent, utilities. Um, this this is really good for us. The amount forgiven is going to be reduced by how you reduce your employee salaries. So what they're trying to do here is basically have you take out a loan so you continue to pay your employees so they don't go on unemployment benefits. But if you if you reduce your employee salaries, you're going to take a, re a proportional deduction from um, what this loan forgiveness you already get. What's important is it also for, uh, provides forgiveness for additional wages paid to tip workers. So for your um, service staff, instead of paying them, you know, you're paying them the minimum wage. We all know nobody can live off of that. Really, they're making their money off of tips. You can come up with some formula. I specifically already asked Heinrich for how, what they're going to do um, to get us any information they have as it relates to this and any regulations as to to how, what kind of formula you can use, or if you can just make up your own as to how you're going to pay your, your tipped, uh, tipped workers. Now, you can't, per, you can't um, borrow from the PPP program if you've already done the disaster loan application. So prohibits borrowers from applying for this loan if you have a previously pending application for a 7A loan for the same purpose. So those of us that went and applied for the, the very first loans that SBA came out, the first loans that the governor announced, you can't apply for this yet. Now remember, we started by saying you can consult, you can go ahead and close on that 7A loan and consult and then apply for the PPP loan and do a, basically a refinance or, or consolidation into the PPP loan. It's a lot of paperwork. But um, these PPP loans, if you haven't applied and you want some specific guidance, we can talk about your individual circumstances privately. So you can decide, do I want to go ahead and go 7A or do I want to look for the PPP? As general guidance today, because this just came out today, um, this PPP program looks like um, something that's going to be the best. Now, as it requires, so let's talk about the, the EIDL loans. Now, these are the economic injury disaster loans. These are the ones the governor talked about. These are the ones that we talked about a week and a half ago or so when I was on this before. The, the thing, good thing about these EID loans is it does waive the personal guarantee on advances and loans below $200,000 if you've been in business for at least one year. So keep in mind that the other 
the, the PPP loan, you have to have been in business before February, okay? If you apply for an EIDL loan, it establishes an emergency grant. So for example, everybody who has applied in the last two weeks and you go and you say, check my loan status, check my loan status, and you click, 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 and you can't get anywhere on the SBA website. What this allows is if you are eligible for that EIDL loan, they will advance you at least $10,000, which they'll distribute to you within three days as, and, uh, to request an advance on, on the loan. Now, it says the word grant, but it also says the word advance on that loan, which means um, that 10,000 would ultimately be reduced by the, the total of the loan. So I'm waiting to get some more guidance on if the 10,000 is necessarily, I don't believe it's, it's a, an outright gift, okay? It establishes that, um, oh, it does say you don't have to repay the advance payments if you're denied for the EIDL loan. So if, you, if you're initially, if you are um, eligible, you apply, you get the $10,000, you ultimately are denied, then you don't have to repay that $10,000. Nice. Now, the grant can be used for the same things that the PPP loan can be used for. It can be used for maintaining payroll, uh, making your rent and mortgage payment, and repaying obligations that cannot be met due to revenue loss. That's a good catch-all clause because that means everything else, okay? And um, it requires the emergency grant to be considered when they're determining the total loan forgiveness that you get when you ultimately, they're really looking at you're going to ultimately refinance this into a PPP program loan. Now, the subsidies, it requires that the SBA, this is just, it pay the principal interest and associated fees that are owed on covered loans for a six month period starting on the next payment due. So that's, that's where that um, came from. And this is gonna be um, on the EI, EIDL loans. These are gonna be on the disaster relief loans, not on the PPP loans. And I know that this is really muddy and messy, but um, what you can take away is that there's two separate programs. If you've already applied for the first, you have to wait before you can apply for the second. And the second is, is what, in my opinion, a better program. So let's talk about unemployment assistance. Uh, many of your employees are already out on unemployment. And um, this, I'm sure the news has covered this adequately, so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here, but it basically says it's gonna now cover self-employed workers, including gig workers and independent contractors, part-time workers, and those with limited work history. This is huge. Um, as restaurants, we have a lot of hostesses who are students, our servers are students, um, we don't have a ton of full-time employees. So this is going to give you, give those employees really some, give you some comfort if you have to do a mass layoff that your employees are going to be eligible for this uh, program. The other thing it does is it includes, it adds an additional 600 in federal pandemic unemployment compensation to every weekly unemployment benefit until July 31, 2020. Okay. This $600 benefit is taxable, but basically what that means is I believe we're at $467 um, max available. We're now, it's going to be at 600 and it, I think it's good that it includes this expiration clause of July 31, 2020, because I think it's going to incentivize everybody to get back to work um, just as soon as we're, we're able to. The other important component is it's a first week, um, compensation is paid the first week of unemployment. So um, if the state didn't ha does not have a waiting week, it doesn't really affect, I, do, I think we do have a waiting week. We do have a waiting week. Yeah, um, that's, so then let's talk about the other uh, rebate. Again, the, the media has covered this very, very well. It's $1,200 for singles and head of household, $2,400 for married couples, um, what's important is non-filers generally need to file a tax return in order to claim a rebate, although the IRS may coordinate with federal agencies for some people. I think this might be important information that you get out to your employees. Again, you, lots of restaurants have students, people who, you know, 
probably don't understand that they have to file taxes, et cetera. But if they want to get this subsidy, they're going to have to file um, the return. And they'll get the subsidy faster if they file the return sooner. But the sooner you file a return, yeah, um, absolutely. Now, regarding the, um, here's another thing that's important for businesses. Many of us have 401ks that have, you know, some sort of nest egg that we can tap into. We don't do that because we have to pay a very high tax and then we have to pay penalties on that money. Right now, for money that you take out um, between January 1 and December 31, 2020, it, and, and what's funny is throughout this entire law, they say, if you are affected by coronavirus, we wouldn't be having this conversation if we weren't affected by coronavirus. So every single business across the board is going to qualify, every business owner is going to qualify for this. But what it basically says is they're waiving the 10% tax on early distributions from IRAs and defined contribution plans. So this might be another place if you're like, look, I don't really want to do a loan. Loan means just that I have to pay it back. Um, you know that you're going to, there's some loan forgiveness for, you know, March, April, May, June. But after that, you might say, you know, I'm still not where I need to be. I have this other sum of money. It, it's, this is a good thing um, as well. The subtitle C on the business provision. So um, Carol and I have had some discussion. This is the provision would prov provide a refundable payroll tax credit for 50% of wages paid to eligible employees um, to certain employees during the crisis. The credit is available to employers, all including nonprofits, um, and wages for employees who are furloughed or face reduced hours, um, or there's an economic hardship are eligible for the credit. The credit is provided for wages and compensation, including health benefits, and is provided for the first 10,000 in wages and compensation paid by the employer to the eligible employee. Um, Again, we're talking, this kind of has this expiration clause, most of these programs of uh, June. So you want to look at this and, you know, most employees aren't going to be in that $10,000 range. Well, but they will, that's only partial $10,000, right? So, yeah. 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 Yeah, up to, it's not, if you don't get $10,000, you get, for each employee, you get up to, up to that if they were in that tax bracket, I guess, or and they made that much money. So, so let, let's talk a little bit. Um, this, the other thing is we've been talking about payroll taxes. The, the provision here allows taxpayers to defer paying the employer portion of the payroll taxes through the end of 2020 with all of the 2020 deferred amounts due in two equal installments one at the end of 2021, the other at the end of 2022, okay? Now, deferral is not provided to employers that avail themselves to the SBA 7A loan designated for payroll, okay? So again, this is a reason why if you've already started that SBA 7A process, finish that out because you have to, but then look for the PPP program to see if you can still defer your employer portion of the payroll taxes. Now, this is I'm not advising any of my clients to actually take this. And if they take it, I'm saying take it for one to two weeks of payroll. Don't play games with this because these are the um, these are the FICA taxes, basically your trust taxes. And at the end of the day, you have to pay this. And if you don't pay the SBA and they sue you, there's going to be ways you can bankruptcy that debt out. If you don't pay the IRS, that's a much different ballgame. And if you don't pay the IRS for 941 taxes, there's, in my experience, nothing you can do about that, but work with them to get them paid as quickly and effectively as you can. So I'm, again, this is really, if there's an absolute hardship, for example, this next payroll, the next, you know, two to four weeks payroll when you're waiting for your SBA 7A loan, you're waiting for your PPP loan, the $10,000 you get as the advance is gonna be just enough to maybe make, um, the lease payment, do it then, but, but be very careful to save this money elsewhere. Or if you end up getting um, the PPP loan, 
you want to go ahead and set aside whatever you need to do to pay these 941s and pay these, these taxes as quickly as possible. Um, you're going to want to see your CPA because there's lots of changes to the, to the tax code in here of which we're not going to go over today. But there's going to be things that come tax time, it's, they will be helpful to us. For those of you that um, distill spirit, you know, there's the excise tax, excuse me. There, uh, there's a change to the excise tax for anything that, that you distill to now make hand sanitizer with. And that's kind of a big deal for those of you who are doing that, but I don't know if there's anybody on this call that's doing that. <clears throat> right, yeah, no, that, that's huge. That, that excise tax, you know, that, you know, between two and 13%. Um, let me go ahead and... This is, this is an important piece that you might want to share with your employees because, again, you have a lot of students, former students, that's just kind of who works in our industry. Uh, this package cancels payments for all federal student loan borrowers with federally held loans um, through September. So if you yourself have these loans, it's going to suspend the interest for the six months, uh, pro prohibits forced collection, garnishment, tax refunds, social security benefits. This is an important piece and it might be a good, you know, kind of just public service information you can put out to your employees to say, you know, look at this, it might apply to you. Because if they're on unemployment, they're waiting for, you know, there's just not enough money, you have to really look at how do you cut monthly household expenses. For many people, this is going to be a huge um, benefit. All right, so limitation on paid leave. This clarifies the limitation on compensation um, during paid leave. Stating an employer shall not be required to pay more than $200 per day, $10,000 in aggregate for each employee under this section. And is that, um, that's from the original relief package, right? So they were clarifying from the original uh, sick leave bill that they passed previously, is that correct? That's what I believe they're doing. But as far as what they're actually doing, who knows? I don't know if this play, this is going to completely replace what they did in the original, but it sounds like what they're doing is just giving more guidance on that. Um, and, and I know that, Carol, you've already gone over much of this. And then I'm, I apologize for my technical savvy that I don't know how to just jump through the PDF um, the way I was hoping. That's okay. You're looking for the yellow pieces that's what we're looking for and it's not exactly we just want the parts that matter to us that's exactly right um not making me car sick yet <laughs> okay close your eyes <laughs> this is all the portion of what the airlines are getting out of this and it's we're, there's one other place I, I need to hit. Here we go. So we talked when I was on this webinar, um, whenever that was, days are running together, that there's this availability for restaurants to take EBT and to have these snap, um, snap wipers. So basically, if you, um, for example, you make all your burritos, you refrigerate them, and then you can accept EBT for them. What that does is it really allows, um, it's gonna just open up additional revenue sources for you now that people are really nervous about spending money because part of the program gives additional funding for, for SNAP and EBT, um, which means it's just, just an extra place you can go look for some revenue. Now, I did talk with um, Jeff Witte, who was helping with uh, Health and Human Services as to how they can expedite, because this is all under the Department of Agriculture, how we can expedite um, applications for you. So any of you that have that want to do an application for so that way you can accept SNAP benefits, if you will please email me separately so I can and I'll try Carol, it's going to be really tough to get them with the right place because so, I don't know where they are within their application. Um, but you can email me and I'll 
direct you and help you get to the right place so that way you can get that um, that started if that's something you want to do. And are you working through the NMSU Department of Ag? Yeah, I, Jeff Whitty has been, I, so I started working with Martin Heinrich. They, um, they're looking on their end, but then Jeff Whitty's the one for New Mexico. So, so he's been, um, I've been working with him on that. Okay, and I also have uh, contact for Dennis Hogan in his, in his office. So if people need yeah. that, let me know. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff, we've been working directly with Jeff, so I don't know who he has on his side that's running it. The other thing that I found was, was interesting is there's $200 million for shelter, food, and supported services. Um, I'm going to really do a deeper dive on how restaurants can, can look to get some of this money. Like, what, where's this money going to go? Um, basically, they're doing big deployments, but how do you become one of these contractors if you want to be able to provide the food and quote supportive services? So those of you, and, and what I'm looking at this, it's not so much for the brick and mortars, but those of you that have a food truck that could potentially go park outside of, you know, the, the tent that can go park in these different areas where this money is allowed to come to. So um, if you have a food truck or you have some sort of mobile way to deliver your product, um, I, I think this is going to be a good place to go get some revenue while you're otherwise shut down. And I believe the rest of this, I just want to double check, is just um, legislative fluff. You know, all, like, I mean, it's not fluff, it's Department of Education stuff, it's everything else they, they, they have in the bill, but um, what I've covered is, is what I believe would be most important for restaurateurs to know. So with that, um, I can stand for questions, and I hope I made sense. At the end of the day, we have two programs. You've already applied for 7A, finish your 7A process, and then refinance into a PPP. Um, if you've already applied for 7A and you are eligible, go ahead and request your $10,000 grant. So that, those are the kind of most important next steps. Antonia, we were told on the NRA call this morning that if you have an e EIDL uh, loan, you cannot have a PPP loan at the same time. They did not mention whether you could move one of those loans into another. It, this, this specifically provides for you to refinance your EIDL into a PPP. Okay, and, and for those of you um, that weren't on the National Restaurant Association's call, I'm gonna, give me, give me a second, I'm gonna bring up some. <clears throat> so um, you guys, uh, while I'm looking for this, if you want to unmute yourself, if you have a question. Um, hello? One at a time, I hear a hello, <clears throat> yes. Hello, yes, this is Patrick from the Cowgirl in Santa Fe. Hey Patrick. Hey, um, I still don't understand where we can get the PPP uh, uh, document, the paperwork for that. Is it a 7A loan? And when we go to 7A, it refers us to two other, a 1919 and a 1920. Where do we get the right paperwork for this? Okay, so this this right now, as, as of the time we got on the call, had not been signed into law yet. So I would expect that we should be able to have, that these programs are gonna be, within the next week or so, we should be able to have the PPP process opened up. I will get, specifics from our um, state senators to tell us exactly where we're going to get that and when we're going to get that so that way we can I can get you a very clear answer on that wh where that PPP process will be managed out of and where you get the where you do the application. Thank you very much we'll look for that from an MRA emails. Sure yeah. Thank you. Hey there it's Jean with Flying Star. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? Hi, yep. Jean. 
Yeah. Hey, um, I can say that I've already been in contact with my bank, which is U.S. Bank. The banks tell me they will, when the paperwork is ready, they'll have it uh, ready. So they said they gave me a form to fill out that I wanted to apply for the PPP. And uh, that's what uh, they recommend doing. Okay. That's good information. Does also, that mean, what? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to speak over you. Does that mean that you actually have a form application in hand? No, they don't have one yet because it had not been signed into law as of earlier today. But what I did was for my bank, provided a form that I could fill out to make sure that they did not overlook me. But I also did talk to my own uh, bank officer as well. Great. I have another question. Oh. Go ahead, Patrick. Uh, this is related to how much you can uh, take out as it's related to your FTEs and that we get from our ACA reports. You know, the maximum amount of loan possible. Yeah. And once we get that loan, does that mean that it can only go to our full-time employees or can we bring on all, because uh, we've just laid off a lot of people, can we bring them all on and distribute that money equally, even though it's not to a, um, a full-time employee? Oh, that's a good question. Let me, can, can I, can I, uh, so let me share with you, what I'm sharing with you is not, now keep in mind, we just got the legislation. Typically that follows with regulations of what, what does this actually mean? So the way I read this is you would be able to bring bring on everybody. Now, the difficulty is whatever amount of money they give you, you know, has to last you through at least June 30, maybe longer. And there's that catch-all provision in the, the um, bill itself that says, you know, any other expenses. So I think if you brought people on and paid them a full wage, I don't see any prohibition in that, if that was the question. Um, yes, that. Yeah. I'd yes. like to jump in and, and add a question to Patrick's. Uh, one thing that we didn't cover is some of this seems to be addressed in some way in loan forgiveness. And I was a little bit fuzzy on that clause. Could we go back over that? Because it seems like if you bring on people, it seems like there's a forgiveness. That's where your forgiveness for this loan is. Yes. That's so, correct. Uh, yeah. And go ahead. Go ahead, Kelly. No, you go no, ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so that's the um, that is the payroll protection program, and in that one, you have to bring back your employees to almost a hundred percent in order to be forgiven for that loan. Is is that dollars uh, percent? Is that salary? hundred percent or is that a number of employees? I read that as as dollars per employee, not not you you have to bring back your, your full workforce. Is that a, the full workforce as of the twenty right. I'm Go ahead. sorry. And and what I can do is anybody that emails Carol and needs additional like you have this specific question. I can and I can go to a deeper dive of from the larger document and then get some guidance on on what what that means. Right, because also there's this March 24th date, and that's as of so it seems like it's uh, the is that the level of your payroll as of March 24th? So there's a few things that were a little bit difficult to understand in that. Yeah, so they're making you look back at your payroll. Um, and as of before March 24th, because obviously some of you have already let these people go. And what they're trying to do is get you to bring those people back on your payroll and get them off of unemployment. So that's, that's their um, motivation in this. And, um, and they're trying to be as broad about it as they can. But if you'll look here, this is from the National Restaurant Association. Um, so the maximum amount of the loan is going to be two and a half months of payroll as calculated by taking the average monthly payments um, right. occurred during the year before or if you're a seasonal employer and which most of us are not i'm not even going to go there um or up to 10 million dollars 
So does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Well, it does and doesn't. I get that, how it's calculated, but it's not, yeah, the clear, yeah, that March 24th, I mean, because if they want you to, by March 23rd, we had already, you know, reduced our payroll pretty significantly. So is this supposed to be back at 100% levels of where we were before this? Because this really started hitting about the 16th for us. Yeah, and they're and they're really looking at an average total uh, from the last year, so a one year period. That that last part of March isn't necessarily gonna, or or even the first part of March isn't necessarily going to bring that average down hugely, right? I wasn't sure I read that because I, what I gathered was that that payroll period from twenty nineteen say. Uh, or is it is it actually from March 24th and 12 months trailing, 12 periods trailing? Because if that's the case, that's the, how they calculate how much uh, money you're uh, eligible for. But it, it didn't seem to say to me that that's what you had to uh, actually, you know, I mean, because it's going to be hard if we're trying to bring, we don't know if we're going to need 100% of our people right away, right? None of us know. Right, and some of those folks won't be eligible to you either. I mean, honestly, some of them have already been on. So I, I don't think you need to worry about that too much. Um, How do you mean eligible? How do you mean, Carol? I just mean they're, they're, they're off working at Walmart now. Yeah, that's Walmart true. Like jobs. And, and interestingly enough, too, and they have mentioned this somewhere down in this document, too, that the... Uh, for the purposes of the Affordable Care Act, full-time employment is 30 hours. That's right. Oh, yes. Important that I think to know. You, for us to all know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I guess, you know, with that still kind of got to get fleshed out. Um, it's, uh, and is it from me? I have another question related to this. <laughs> Just one second. A lot of this does need to get fleshed out, and I want you, I want you guys to know that we are doing that um, at the national level and, and here in New Mexico, just to make it easier for you. But one of the things I want you guys to do and is apply for those loans at the SBA. Um, Antonia, do you want to tell them about your experience with the SBA as oh. of today? Yeah, so when we did, um, I did a, a full small business um, Facebook Live, uh, whatever, a couple weeks ago. So in order to do that, I went through and I did the entire, the 7A process. I did the whole SBA program um, loan application. And when you go back and you check what's the status, what it specifically said, like it, the website pretty much almost crashes. Like nothing, nothing's there. You have to email them, you email them, and then they give you back a stock message saying, you know, thank you for emailing us. Here's a phone number you can call or you can email us at the email you just emailed us at. So it's very circular <laughs> right get, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You're gonna get the same answer you and just kind of help. So, so I think one, one good thing about what they just did now is if you're otherwise eligible, they're gonna do that $10,000 grant because I'm not optimistic that this money is gonna come as soon as you need it to make that next payroll come, come next week when everybody has to pay your leasehold, you know, I don't know that this money's going to be here by then, but hopefully we'll have something in place to get the $10,000 grants done. Antonio, this is Tom Hutchinson. Um, I've got a, I got some correspondence from uh, Independent Community Bankers Association that now that uh, SBA has some direction from this legislation, it's going to be up to 15 days before they get directives out to their member banks to, to start dealing with this. So to your point, uh, it's going to be a couple weeks before uh, you'll get PPP paperwork to uh, actually start filing this stuff. Um, I have another point. I joined you guys just a little bit late. But Carol, was there any discussion regarding the conflict that exists between filing the PPP and trying to get all our employees to come back to work and 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 uh, and executing our current payroll versus uh, what they're getting paid right now with the $600 uh, unemployment enhancement on top of the, what they're collecting. I mean, it, it, some of my folks, it, it's, it makes more sense for them to stay home for four months. I agree. And I don't, <clears throat> so 
Yes, we talked about that extensively on the NRA call. We have not talked about that yet. So that's something that you all, you know, might make the call differently if, if you know this. I mean, they're going to get enhanced unemployment and um, it may be better than ever coming back to work for you. Um, so, well, But it only lasts four months. So right. they got, they're going to have to make the call. But but yeah, right now, if I was to file my PPP and try to get all my people back, uh, I might have some say, you know, I don't want to do that. And, and that impacts my eligibility for PPP. Right. So, so Tom, there's another consideration on uh, another level to that, that we have to deal with here in New Mexico. And that's that we basically are under this, you know, stay at home instruction. It's not a she can't give us a, a shelter in place order, but we're under this instruction and we can't have more than five people in our premises at any one time anyway. It's so I precisely. think the difficulty, is, yeah, the, the crux here is we're gonna say, we're gonna put you back on payroll. We're gonna continue to pay you, but we don't know when we can reopen and we actually can't use you other than maybe you start doing, you know, maybe our restaurants become just the most immaculately clean place we've ever been with every basket being, you know, cleaned once a week where, you know, th those are sort of options, but we have this, it, it's just really, you know, we want to bring people back, put them back on payroll. Now I can tell you the way, you know, what you want to look at this for is like your management, your people that you don't want to lose that are important to your business where you say, look, you're going to be off, but we're going to use this time. I need everybody to be doing all these other sort of things from home. Like let's, let's home fix processes, let's do all this other stuff if you choose to bring them back, but bringing them back doesn't mean that they get to be in your premise. So one thing I yeah. have to say really quick is um, just, uh, Antonia, it's only five guests in your business, but you can have more than five employees on your, on your premise. So keep that in but, mind as well. But to, but to Antonio's point, Let's just, let, me, let me just play this out for me. I bring back 100 employees. I stick them in my restaurant. Hell, what, how, how does that accommodate social spacing? Um, <laughs> well, it wouldn't. They're not, they're, their motivation in this is to get, get people, you know, I, I, and we all know this from work comp, is that we want people going back to work as quickly as possible. And that is their motivation in doing this. Um, hey, I, they Carol, demotivated, they yeah. demotivated people through the, the $600. Um, and I, I have a feeling that that will be one of the things that they, they come back and, and change in the next corrections. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let me jump in, Carol. So, you know, I hear all this, but this is not going to be right away, I think. And we don't know when this, uh, you know, shutdown for New Mexico will be lifted, but if this timing works out, this can help pay for our restaurants powering back up. And in our case, we've left uh, all of our critical managers in place right now uh, because of we need them. We just can't let them go. We, we, we're still trying to eke out a small living here at Flying Star and Satellites. So that will help us pay for the people we can keep because we're not shut down entirely. But also, if the, like I said, if the timing's right, it could be just perfect to afford getting yourself back up and running. Well, I, I agree with that, but but I think the big qualifier for PPP and getting some of those dollars to offset your expenses is going to be your ability to match payroll. And and if we don't do that, we don't qualify for some of these other things. That's how I, that's how I read it. I'm not sure I do. It's also going to be as when we could get the money. I don't believe for a second we'll have this money in sooner than three to four weeks, one would assume. I agree with you there. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Again, we can't know. Hey guys, it's. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, hey, it's George at Tomasinas. Hey George. Um, can, I, mean, I only missed the first like two minutes of the call, and I feel like I'm still a little lost, but I've got it caught up. Let me just walk through what I think you're saying, and if you could correct me, and I'm I'm not just doing this for myself. I think it'd be helpful for everybody. Sure. So I've already laid off my staff, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have the same amount of hours for them to do, obviously, with 10% of the business that I had before. So what I would do is I would go to my, I would go to my bank, and, and I haven't got any of these other loans yet. 
So I would go to my bank. I would sign up for the SBA PPP loan as soon as I can, and I would borrow a bunch of money. Then I would hire back as many people as I could, hire back a bunch of people and put them to work doing something. Or not. And then, or, or just pay them to be at home. That's one of my questions. Mm -hmm. And and then, it's, and then when the dust settles, I basically give them the, the prove that I paid all these people and the portion for whatever I paid them would be forgiven. Is, is all of that basically correct? That is, and there's some, uh, there's some very minute things that um, have to be considered. And that is what portion of your payroll are you bringing back on? So if it's only, if you're only bringing on 50% of your payroll, they're not going to forgive the whole payroll. They're only going to forgive 50%. So, and okay, so it would be better for me to hire everybody back, pay them to stay at home, bring in the ones I needed, they would get the money and then I would get reimbursed. But I, is that what you're saying? I'm not saying that because I'm not your lawyer and I'm not your accountant. Right, right, right. Right. But that's what the law says. The law says, well, if the law says I should bring, I have to bring them all back and I'm eligible to get comp. Well, let's say I only bring half of them back, right? Or half the dollars back. I would be, I would still be compensated for 50% of that payroll. The loan forgiveness would only be at 50%. And that is, that is the part that on the national restaurant call today, they said they don't have clarification on that. They're asking for clarification to make sure that that is okay. because it's, but, but, but what's not, exactly what's not clear to me, Hey, George, what's not clear to me with your scenario, you need to understand that you'll also get uh, forgiveness for your operating expenses during that period. And I'm, I'm not sure, Carol, if you come back, if you bring back uh, less than 100% of your employees or payroll number, that that, I don't, I don't know that, how that impacts your forgiveness for other, your other operating expenses they're prepared to, to pay you for. Right. So read it here. Okay. The amount forgiven will be reduced proportionally by any reduction in the employees retained compared to the prior year reduced by the reduction in pay of any employee beyond 25% of their prior year compensation. Now, if that didn't confuse you, it should have. That's right. <laughs> that, that could just mean that they're just paying us for as much as we actually hire back. Well, they should yeah. have said that then. Yeah, that's yeah. what they should okay, say. Okay, so let me just so let me just say this, because I've never, I've never got a government loan before, and you know, and I'm going to I'm going to, you know, I'm going to demean myself. What's the word? Is that demean? Yeah, demean myself and do it. But I could just borrow as much as I possibly can right now. Wait for this to become clear before I start spending it. And then, you know, have forgiven what I can have forgiven and pay back the rest in six months. Antonia, yes. this is Tom Brionis. Hey, Tom. Hey, I think I have a... I think the way I interpret it is that the maximum that you can borrow is based upon whatever your payroll was in 2019, averaged out to a monthly amount times two and a half. That's the maximum you can borrow. You can borrow less if you want, but that's the maximum. How you spend it is really irrelevant. The purpose is how is to spend it on payroll, et cetera, but you account to it after a certain period of time and if you meet certain criteria some or all of it could be forgiven uh and if that's the case then great but that to the extent that there are monies that are um, have not been spent or accounted for in account in accordance with that plan that you will still be responsible for paying back to the government that's how i interpret it Right. I mean, the thing is, is that I'm the only reason I'm hiring people back is because I think I'm going to get compensated and to help them out. So I'm taking a risk by hiring these people back if I'm not going to have it forgiven. Well, I think I think you're you're using the words wrong. I don't think it's compensation. It's a loan. It's just a matter of whether or not or what percentage you get forgiven. It's not compensation right. to you. Right, right. But it's still, I mean, the only reason I'm doing it is because I'm not going to pay for it. You know, I, I'm running my, 
so basically that's kind of and that's what they want though apparently so it and is. just it's to make one, one other it's, it's much better for them to have these employees off of unemployment and and ready to work again they right. you know they're they're experiencing unemployment numbers that they have no idea what to do with so they're this right. is trying to push people off of the unemployment and back back to you so that you're ready to to start up again well, that six hundred dollar right. enhancement didn't help this a whole lot. No, it did not. Well, you know what though? I think a lot of. Let me just ask my last question, and I'll, I'll mute up. We do all of this through our existing bank, and they help us with the government piece. Correct. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then, can I put them to work cleaning my ranch, picking weeds at my ranch? Oh. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I only have ten percent. I only have ten percent of the business. How am I going to justify a, 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 you know, how am I going to justify a hundred and fifty thousand dollar payroll on thirty thousand dollars in sales? That's the conflict in all this, George. Okay. The, the, other, this, the other option is is you don't borrow that much money. If you if you are if it looks right. like you're not going to be able to fulfill those obligations, there is the option not mm -hmm. to borrow that money because there is the risk that it may be required to be paid back. Well, and right. two point five times your payroll is is just not a lot of money, right? I mean, it is a lot of money, obviously, case. but it it really only gets you two months of payroll. Right, right. Hey, Carol, okay. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just one thing. It's two and a half times <laughs> what maximum of your previous payroll, so it could be rather considerable. Right now, if you're ten percent of your old self, that's that's not much money. But if you have the amount of money that you were prior, that's a fair amount of cash in my book. It also keeps other expenses from uh, building up, uh, and and you know some of the interest that landlords or other folks might charge you might actually uh, be a lot more expensive than four percent. And when you guys are ready, I have a question over here from Alice Garcia, our HR director. Um, hi. What's to say that employees continue to stay on unemployment insurance or the benefits if we are uh, giving them a compensation? Yeah, I mean, they, they can they can essentially collect both their 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 hourly rate here and then plus continue with unemployment they insurance. Reduced, their reduced rates. Well, there's no way to report that. I mean, do they just change their status back to working again? Well, I yes, and I haven't heard from the the uh, director as to how they're going to prove that, but it is. I mean, that is fraudulent. That'd be fraud for them on their part. Yeah. That's not our responsibility. So let's say that uh, some employees have already started collecting unemployment because they filed early on when all this happened. Sure. So do they have to return that money? Because that's going to be no. their question. I, I doubt, have, I mean, you know, oh, so there, there was a first week where they didn't get anything. There's possibly been a second week, depending on when you made these changes, where they got a check. And then when you hire them back, they may get another check, but that will be, I, okay. I believe it's in arrears. So I think it all works out. Hey, Carol, okay. can you hear me? That's, yes. Carol, can you hear me? Yep. Hey, um, just to clarify to some of George's points from what I got from the NRA meeting this morning was that um, we have to choose that this forgiveness is only for an eight week period that we choose and it needs to end by the end of June 30th. That's, that's correct. So if you read, can you guys see my um, screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And if you read that, the forgiveness on a covered loan is equal to the sum of the payroll cost covered in an eight-week period compared to the previous year. Oh, well, that doesn't have to do with how long you can do this. Yes. So I, I guess we're all expecting the, the government to lift this ban um, at least in the next eight weeks. So does that mean that this is... We, it will apply, if we use these funds, they only apply for payroll relief for an eight week period? I don't know. But I, I would, don't either. 
<laughs> yeah, I would think that is the case. I mean, it's it's really to keep you going right now and get you through a startup, which I, I guess what they're saying to us is, is going to be eight weeks from now. And, and we don't have to operate while this is going on. We can just pay them and they could stay at home. Yep. Thank you. Carol, I have a question. Matt DeGregory. Hi, Matt. Um, so two days ago, we heard from the um, John Garcia with the SBA about applying for the EIDL loan. And I'm getting ready to send all that off. And I'm now hearing about the PPP loan. I'm confused more than ever as to which I should do, or should I be doing both? <laughs> I'm so sorry because I, I, you know, as I was listening to the NRA today, I'm thinking, how does anybody know which of these to get? You know, you get the loan forgiveness with the PPP loan, but, but then you have to hire your people back and you're basically getting the loan forgiveness for money that you wouldn't have otherwise spent. Um, so I think, I think honestly, I'm going to say all of you probably need to, to consult a CPA and or your lawyer right now and your banker to figure out which one of these loans is better for you because with the EIDL loan, you get the $10,000, the grant, and it comes now. And if you leave your people on unemployment and you get that $10,000, you can use that $10,000. And I know this probably doesn't even cover your, your mortgage or your um, rent, but um, it's money now that you're not gonna get otherwise. Um, and obviously you're not going to hire people back until you get for this forgiveness loan until you get the loan. That just wouldn't make sense. Hey, Carol, you cannot, from what I understand, you cannot have both loans at the same time. You cannot. So That's what, correct. what Antonia was saying is that you could apply for the EIDL loan <clears throat> and then when this payroll protection program comes in, you can move the application process over. Is that right, Antonia? No, no, I don't. I don't see it that way. Um, but what it says, what what it says is that you, if you have the e EDIL loan, then you can uh, refinance it into a PPP loan. Okay, so. So maybe the, the thing is, is that you apply for the EIDL loan because that's the one that's available right now. And then before you sign those papers, um, if the PPP loan is available, then you look at what, because our situations are changing daily and you look at what the situation is. Is it better for me to bring people back on and have the loan forgiven? or is it better for me to keep this EIDL loan? And, and no matter what, now, Antonia, tell me if I'm right about this, the $10,000, you get that anyway? On the EID, yes, if you, you, if you don't qualify, no, so if you don't qualify for the economic loan, you apply for it, they give you the $10,000, you don't have to pay, the 10,000 you don't have to pay back. Okay, but what if you what if you qualify for it and then you want to change it to the PPP loan? The way I read that, and I'm glad Tom's on the, the call, he can definitely tell me if he sees it differently, but the way I understand that to work is the $10,000, you know, it says it's an advance. So um, I think that's all inclusive. So if you get, you know, $100,000, you then take that $100,000 and you refinance it into a PPP loan. Uh, Antonio, it's not clear to me. I'm trying to get uh, clarification on that, but uh, that's a good question. So, um, I am not your lawyer and I am not your accountant. <laughs> I, I think it would be a good move because you can't even apply for a PPP loan yet. I think it would be a good move. And here's my thing is I want you guys to get some of these loans and there's, I don't know, a trillion dollars that went into this. And there's millions of restaurants that are applying for these loans right now. And I don't want you to get locked out. 
So get in, apply, um, and as we get clarity, we'll give you that clarity. But as long as we think, and as long as your banker says that you can, you know, um, move this EIDL loan into a PPP loan, I think it's really going to matter where we're at in, in this whole COVID thing, whether you want to do that or not at that time. And I don't know if that's, I really, really, really sincerely don't know if that's good advice or not. So please talk to your professional advisors. They may or may not know any more than we do. This bill was passed today. Um, even the sick leave bill that was passed a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, it doesn't even start until April 2nd, I believe, where you can, where you have to pay your employees sick leave. So you know, we're not even there yet. Um, so, and that's another consideration. If you bring your employees on and they um, are sick or have family that's sick or um, what's the other one? Or they have to quarantine for 14 days because they come in contact with this, then you're gonna pay them sick leave instead of their wages. But again, that will be forgiven in a, in a tax credit on your quarterly taxes. This is so much fun, guys. Things you never wanted to know. I'm so sorry. Um, Carol, can, you, yeah. can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, this is Sam from you know, the Governors in Del Charo. Hey, um, I'm gonna start with two real simple questions. Um, it, do, you, do we feel that although this has not been finalized and voted on, that this is quite accurate representation of what we will get? Yes. We talked about that before this call. And um, <coughs> as far as we know, the House voted on the exact same version the Senate voted on. And this is the bill that's going to, um, to the president to sign. So that's what we have when we started this call an hour ago. Apparently he's right. signed already. Okay. I'm sorry, what? Apparently he signed it already. He did. Okay. So, um, okay, that's good news. And then after um, we, if he signed it, then we're moving into finalizing the organization. Is NMRA or NRA going to perhaps have a fact sheet that combines like all the resources we can go to for these various things? Um, yeah. so I do hear a big part of it is talking to our individual banker for our business, but is that something that will be out there for us to sort of collect our thoughts and organize around? Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure that's kind of the next step is to, and also, I, I mean, I'm going to ask them for, you know, as they're going through this and, and they mentioned that they're working with the small business administration and other um, parts of the administration to get clarification and regulations out as quickly as possible so that the banks know what to do, the CPAs know what to do, we know what to do, and NRA. So this is the NRA site, and we can put this same information up on our website, but for right now, it's on uh, restaurant.org COVID-19. <coughs> Excuse me. This is- Okay, thank you. And then. Yeah, so this uh, is, this is their summarize kind of go ahead. I'm sorry, Carol. This is their summary of of the bill. And then I'm also going to put up what um, Antonia had uh, us go through earlier, which I think is is more in depth. Okay, so that's great. Website. Go ahead. Sorry. And then just to, to kind of summarize what we're talking about when it comes to taking these loans and bringing employees back on, even if they're, if I have my employees clean George's ranch, um, that we're taking a gamble that we take these loans out, hoping they'll get um, forgiven for us against the best guess of when we might actually be able to be open again and people can come out on the streets. Is that right? That we are kind of gambling that if an we've done this and there's, there's that two, there's that eight week window that the country could still be completely shut down at that point. And we've taken out these big loans 
um, hoping it wasn't going to be shut down. Do I, do I summarize correctly what we're deciding on here individually? Antonio, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, there's, there's absolute risk. It's, it, it's not called a grant. It's not called compensation. It's called a loan. So there's always risk when you take a loan that one that we know from New Mexico that our schools aren't opening up again this year. What that means right. for how long, you know, the governor's going to end up keeping this instruction in place, we don't know. So it is a risk. It's a risk that in eight weeks, you know, things aren't back up open for business. Um, that's probably why they put that loan forgiveness piece in there. But it's, it's possible that at the end of all this, you take out this money, things don't open back up on the timeline. And then you you get forgiven and your employees ultimately get laid off anyway. The other piece of this is, and, and this is what I think would be true, I don't, I don't know it to be certain, but I think if we're gonna be shut down longer than what this program anticipates, they're gonna go through and start doing amendments to extend these dates. So Can you promise the, other that? Thing, the other thing to keep in mind is the length of these loans and the interest rates. So from what I understand, the PPP loan is a 10-year loan at 4% interest, and the EIDL loan is um, a 30-year loan at 3.75% interest. So, and, and those are the lowest interest rates they're giving. I think your banker is gonna possibly do something different than that, but that is what they're, they're saying. Um, and so that should, that should go into your calculation. So that was more than you wanted to know. Uh, it, are there any other questions? I hate to keep people on, but I know you guys have questions. So I just I do have one other question. Mm -hmm. um, does, in terms of the loan forgiveness and stuff like that, what if we hire new employees that are, that are not our current employees? What, just to work on your ranch? No, no. Like for example, I, for example, I need to hire a, uh, I need to hire a high-powered financial person to help me with this. But also, like, you know, like I have, you know, different ownership at the different restaurants, and I hire somebody from one restaurant to work at another restaurant, or I hire someone's cousin because they really need the work, and That's all my other employees don't want to come back because they're on yeah, unemployment. So they're not looking at the particular employees that you're hiring back. I think they're just okay. looking at the payroll numbers. Okay. So you can't, and you can't put anybody on for over a hundred thousand dollars because they're not gonna, they're not gonna help you. Right. Anymore. So nobody really high powered. Okay, but but definitely mid, like you know, if I, they want to keep people employed, so it doesn't matter who I, if I hire somebody new or whatever. I think that's true. I. Okay. Yeah. Carol. Great. Listen. Thank you. Yeah. Carol, this is Allison. Uh, this doesn't have to do with the federal package, but I just wanted to make everyone aware. I had a conversation with Comcast Business today, and they were telling me that they're doing some things to help out um, businesses that have um, Comcast Business. So if you guys have Comcast Business, I think they're, what they're doing is giving you like a 30-day forgiveness um, and then if this, if, if everything lasts longer, call them back and they'll extend or something along those lines. So it, it's worth checking out if you have Comcast business uh, for your phone and internet. Thanks. I Thank you. That. We'll use that in our, um, in our office. Yeah. Um, any other questions, thoughts? We move into um, not for now from Sam, but. Um, thank you for all the organization of this, and, and if and when we can get a uh, dumbed down for uh, Sam people version of these resources, that'll be great. But we'll do it. Can I just call. ask a quick question about unemployment? Yep. So we're receiving all these forms now from Workforce that are the standard forms to fill out for unemployment. Do we, can we just ignore these and not send them in? Because really, they're not even applicable and they don't even refer to the coronavirus at all. And it's like, you know, I'm getting tons and tons of these now. You know what, um, Alice, if you would work with me, I talked to the, um, the secretary the other day and I asked him if there's some way that the employer could just send in, here's my payroll and here's the people that were on it. 
um, because it's, you know, if you have to do this one by one, that's ridiculous. Um, he said, no, he doesn't want to change his processes right now because this is what's working for them. I have to tell you, I don't think it's working for them, but um, I need to understand the process better um, <clears throat> because if we want them to change the process, I've got to be able to tell him what needs changing. And, and just so you know, he's not very willing to have this conversation, but um, he wasn't really willing to have the conversation about um, neutralizing the, uh, the rates either. And so we, we kept the pressure on him about that. And I've got some uh, coalition partners that are also interested in this piece. And I just need to understand it a little bit better so I can go back to him and say, wouldn't it be better if we did it this way, right? So let's give him- Can, can I respond to that just because I just did it? Yeah. Um, number one, it's a lot easier if you do it online, if you have your account set up, and for me, it was my, my CPA, my guy that had it, the information. And the one thing I would say, Carol, is they ask you for the total wages for the entire time period that they worked for you. And if you've had different account payroll companies and stuff, that's really hard to pull together. Like, you know, I've had someone that was with me for 12 years and, you know, I put in, you know, $740,000 or whatever they made over the last 12 years. So if, if they could just make it, what does this person earn in the last year or whatever, that would be something. But it's definitely much easier if you do it on the website versus a piece of papers, and I'm sure they would appreciate it. May, may, I, may I interject, Carol? This is Marina. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, hold on one moment. It's okay. Um, so I've, I've been on the phone um, with them on and off as well. I have a multiple, uh, um, the multiple lists of, of all the people filing. And so I've talked to three different people and kind of reconfirmed the same thing with three different people because I am never comfortable that one person's giving me the absolute right answer. Um, but I, I asked them, I said, okay, I'm getting all these emails because that's how I get notified. And then I go on the system and you're absolutely right. Doing it online is so much easier. Um, and they suggest going to the inbox first and at the below the inbox, they have the list of all the immediate things that you have to respond to. And they do suggest that you do take the time to respond to them and that you put in your answer. I, I put the restaurant was, had to close because of the mandate of New Mexico governor because of the coronavirus threat or crisis. Mm -hmm. They just recommended that you include that anyway in all your responses, if that is the reason that you furloughed employees. I also put that I didn't you know, necessarily terminate them, but I furloughed them. Um, so that's one part of it. The other thing that three different people confirmed was where it asks you that total, and you're right, I have a lot of employees that have been working with me for many years as well. So if somebody's been with you from 2012 up until two weeks ago or a week ago, it asked you for all their wages. Each one of them confirmed, if you are up and and they have all of your quarterly um, wages, like if you're up on all your taxes and you pay stuff on time, they actually go back and they're the ones that put in the, the actual amounts for the quarters and they do not go back 12 years or 10 years or even five years, but they have all that already. So she had said, just put on, put in the, quarter to date so if they have again i'll be trying to be clear about it if they have all if you're really good at filing on time and they have all your quarterly taxes from 2019 really all they're looking for are the taxes they don't have which because we haven't done quarterly taxes yet is going to be january 1 to march whatever day you you do that so that is the total that they're looking for Again, I told her, it says on the paperwork right there that you want all of the wages, and that's, again, ludicrous. It makes no sense. She said, yes, don't don't follow that. I'm telling you to put January 1 to March. And that's, again, uh, with the presumption that they have all the paperwork prior to that. So for 15 employees now, I think I've just put in from January 1 to now for their wages. And then they will go back and, and they base it on the quarterlies that you've turned in 
already. So that may be helpful, may not be helpful, but that's the information that I've been giving. They also recommended, I said, so after I go through the inbox and I go through employee by employee, fill out the paperwork saying, I, you know, I've, I've temporarily let them go, fill out everything I need to. I said, can I ignore all my emails? <laughs> and they're like, no, after that, we recommend you go through one by one, plug in the document number and pull up and see what that is. So they're, they don't certainly make it easy for you, but I don't think they really want you. I, I think you're, I think it's beneficial to you as an employer to fill out the paperwork clearly stating this is a part of the coronavirus thing and it, it's not a simple check mark. I put it on every single employee when there's an explanation and sometimes I would just put it down three different times like the same thing and copy and paste it just to be sure they understand this is all related to us being mandated to close down, et cetera. So Marina, I have a, one question on that. Did any of those three people give that to you in writing or was it all spoken? No, no, this is all, all spoken. I may mean, have each of their names written down the day I talked to them, et cetera, but I even had my bookkeeper call so that I'm like, did they, is this what they told you? And she said, she, she's actually the one who brought it up first. And then each time I called, I'm like, can you reconfirm this with you? Because I mean, it makes perfect sense. When you get the other forms, right? There's a, a payment, uh, a monetary determination, all of those forms, at least for me, when I get them, they're all filled in and they're exact to the penny because it's been taken from my quarterly reports. So, you know, I'm not doubting that that's what they're doing. I'm just, for me, it made no sense. Like, like you said, one employee was, you know, two hundred and forty-two thousand dollars. How how the hell does that help anybody? It doesn't. Yeah. Right. So, so I, they didn't put it in writing, but each one of them confirmed the same thing. And again, I don't think at this point they're you know you're we're going to get dinged because we put that amount rather than um, you know the amount that they actually asked for. And and all they say is yeah, these forms need to be updated. I'm like, how long would that take somebody to do? Five <laughs> minutes? Like update the damn form. So it makes it clear and understandable. And at this point, yes, there should be something you can check off. Is this related to the mandate by the governor or the coronavirus? Uh, but no, not, none of them say anything. So I'm that. going to um, contact the secretary and see if we can get clarification in writing. Okay. So Thank I can you. all feel comfortable doing that. Um, sure. I do believe that would make a difference. Um, okay. Allison, I may need your help on that. Hey, Carol. Yeah. Okay. Uh, related to unemployment taxes, would it, it seems like we may have some onerous taxes coming down the road. Is there any um, idea of perhaps asking the NRA to lobby on behalf of freezing uh, or capping those rates? Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, which taxes are you talking about? Uh, uh, what we would have to pay for uh, workman's compensation insurances for the insurance companies. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think Workman's Comp is going to be a problem. I don't think the rates are going to go up, but the unemployment can be a problem. That's what I meant. Excuse yeah. me. The unemployment. I, I had that wrong. I had no, that no, wrong. We, always, we always get that uh, mixed up. So um, uh, we have, the governor did say through the Secretary of Workforce Solutions that they were going to mutualize the um, the account. So your account isn't going to be hit with this and nobody else's account is hit. All accounts are gonna be hit with the same rate increase over all of our unemployment statewide. So that's for state unemployment. Now, um, the secretary was also hopeful that in some of this package of relief that they're going to get relief on, an, uh, on a statewide basis for our unemployment fund, which I believe they will. Um, with $2 trillion, I'm thinking that some of that is going to go into unemployment funds across the states. Um, I haven't heard, I don't know if that's true, but that is something that we've been told. So hopefully, it, and the secretary did tell us, you know, they don't calculate those rates until July, and then they don't increase the rates until January of the next year. 
So we have some time to work on this and we'll be working with the legislature through a special session, I would assume. And then of course, we'll be looking for that, <laughs> that uh, federal relief to go into our unemployment fund. So any other questions, any other thoughts? Hi, Carol, this is Janine, can you hear me? I can, how are you? I'm good. Um, I have a question too, because um, on these unemployment documents that we're all getting inundated with, mm -hmm. it gives you, um, it says to protect your rights, you need to complete the questionnaire lo no later than the 30th of March. Do you think you can have the answer um, in writing on how to correctly fill out the form online by then? Oh. Hopefully. It's the 27th. I don't know. I mean, I've got, I've got him on speed dial, but. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, that was one. That, yeah. yeah. Let me, let me try to get that by March 30th. But, but in the meantime, I don't that's know. Tuesday. Is that, that's Tuesday, right? Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We can, we can try to call him uh, this weekend. I don't know if we can get anything uh, okay. through, but yeah. hopefully by Monday. Okay, that was so, one. And Marina, one. Marina, before we leave this, would you please send me the names of those three people? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Can, um, I might be cutting out right now. Can I just email that to you, Carol? Yeah, just email it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. You've got my email, executive at restaurants.org. Executive at... Okay. Hi, Carol. I've got a quick question. Sure. Hi, this is, this is Michael um, Dennis. Uh, I am um, wondering about gross receipts tax. I don't think it's been brought up. Um, has there been any word as to an extension on GRT? There has not been. And it was due two days ago, right? Yeah, that's Yes, um, yes, that's correct. I, I can, I do know that we've, um, let, this is Allison, um, we're trying to work with other uh, business groups to try to get that dialogue going on gross receipts tax, um, but I have not heard from the, the new person who's trying to put all that together in, in the last few days, but I will follow up. Yeah, the income tax isn't due until July 15th, you know, things like that, but we have not heard anything, any good news as far as the uh, gross receipts tax. Obviously, next next month you won't have any gross receipts tax or very little. But this month, um, that payment was due on some good sales. So I'm sorry about that. Anyway, Carol. Yeah. This is Michael Calhoun with Red River Brewing Company. Uh, about gross receipts tax, it's my understanding that that that's a fundamentally different tax. Uh, it's not a tax that we as restaurant owners are paying. It's a tax that our customers have already paid. We're merely collecting the money and holding it on behalf of the state until we remit it by the 25th of the month. So I would not expect uh, gross receipts tax, tax payments to be deferred at all for that reason. Yeah, I, I mean, there's more than that reason. You know, the cities and counties use that money. That's some of the only money they have coming in. So I can see where they're, they're going to be hurting too. But, um, and I think this is going to be the heavy one, the one that was due, you know, two days ago. That's the one that um, we were all having good, a good month and that amount was due now after we've spent it on some other things. So, and if I can address a little bit on that, uh, the question that we were going to be asking the department was not necessarily to defer those taxes, but just uh, take it easy on us with penalties and interest if we were delayed in paying. So we'll still keep working on that and see if we can get some forgiveness in, in arrears. Anybody else? I just wanted to know how we could get a copy of today's webinar. It's going to be on our website. So our website has this on it. I don't think we got yesterday's on because I still haven't edited the idiots out of it. Sorry, my controls are in front of my website. Um, so if you go on our page to coronavirus resources, go all the way down to the bottom of the page. Um, this is where we're posting all of these daily calls. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, and um, I've been starting the recordings late. I apologize, Antonia. I did not, um, I don't think I started before I introduced you. So our guest host today was Antonia Royball Mack, in case I didn't get that on there. I think everybody's aware of that. Um, thank you all for being here. We'll keep doing these calls until you don't show up anymore. And we'll try to bring you some good information. If any of you have an accountant that would like to do a call with me, I would love to have an accountant on to help you all with some of these decisions. So thanks so much. Appreciate you being here. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a great Thank you. Day, guys, or try. <laughs>